We're calling to order today commission meeting number 287 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. Microphone. Oh, my apologies. Good morning. We're calling to order commission meeting number 287 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on Thursday, January 23rd at 10 a.m. at the Massachusetts Gaming Commission offices here at 101 Federal Street in Boston. We'll begin with item number two, Commissioner Stebbins, please. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, in your packet, you have some of the revised and updated minutes from the December 19th, 2019 meeting. Uh, we had made some updates and some additional notes within those minutes, I believe, around the discussion around sealed records. Um, I would move their approval subject to correction for any typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Um, Before we move on to that, actually, if I could just suggest one additional edit. Okay, um, sure. I had asked that um, if you go to page two, I'd ask that some of my uh, questions and concerns be more explicitly raised in the minutes. Some of them are. The only other area I would ask is um, just before the 10.33 a.m. entry that talks about Director Wells going through the IEB process, if it could just be reflected that she did that at my request. So a uh, sentence to the effect of Commissioner O'Brien asked Director Wells to detail for the record the IEB process regarding open source materials and then the possible later discovery of sealed record materials. We can incorporate that language. If you have it written down, we can share it with Shara yeah. and include those in the minutes. Okay. Um, this, that makes me feel a little better because I had some additional, <laughs> <laughs> additional edits and I um, was reminded that we have done this done once. But um, where, where it says, where I start on 11, at 1108 on uh, the discussion of Region C, Mm -hmm. um, I think the sentence um, is, is, is a summary, uh, but I would like to just um, introduce the, what I remember talking about, uh, which was uh, some of the history of this region, which included a lower capital investment. Um, and that was some of the discussions that, mm -hmm. that happened there, um, as well as uh, perhaps later in that time frame um, that uh, a, a point that I made that um, ultimately this will be a judgment call. There's, there should be no impression that um, any answers to the questions on an RFI or otherwise um, are going to uh, make it any easier for us to decide to open this region or not. Um, and that the best indicator that uh, there might be a market is the willingness of, uh, of an experienced operator to put up money for it, which again are points I made in that. Does it make sense thing. then for us to uh, table uh, this matter and have Shara go back to the transcript and maybe look, um, and we don't always ask for the, this kind of detail. We appreciate that there has mm -hmm. to be some judgment around that, but it sounds as though you'd like to incorporate that yes. in the minutes more formally and so if we could go back to our transcript, um, our, which is, of course, available to the public always. And um, yeah, and I'll, I'll, and I'll, I'll help you, uh, Shara. I think, uh, you know, it was a bit of a, you know, long diatribe, if you will, but it's two key ideas that I wanted to. You wouldn't do that. <laughs> right. It was it, a it was lengthy. meeting that day. It was lengthy, <laughs> is my point, and the idea. <laughs> And, and the idea is not to recreate that and amend or any of that. Language. We're going to incorporate language. No, it's really to extract the two main ideas, and, and I think those are the two ones. Okay. But I'll, that was I'll, getting to my point. You can't yes. always necessarily do the entire right. um, our, our entire uh, comments, but in this case, it sounds as though that is important for this topic to yes. get in our written record as mm -hmm. well as our transcript. So, as well as uh, Commissioner O'Brien's. Um, Point. So we'll table again and uh, we'll bring them back. Thank you, Shara. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, our minutes are already very comprehensive, so thank you. Anything uh, else that we need to mention on those right now? Okay, thank you. Um, all right, I'm a little hesitant, but I'll move forward. <laughs> to ask approval for the January 9th. 2020 uh, meeting minutes, which are included in your packet, as always, subject to 
any typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Second. Can I offer, this is a small edit, it's not a, a law. Um, on page two, uh, when, when, I, when we were against, again talking about um, the Region C, RFI, um, the second to last paragraph, uh, where I opine that there is a definite possibility that the RFI will result in a market study, um, I suggest we continue that sentence to say, but it's not a foregone conclusion. Uh, Again, this, this reflects the notion that it's, it's, it's still, a, at least in my mind, um, a judgment call mm -hmm. as to even whether to conduct a market study. So the sentence would read, will result in a market study, but it's not a foregone conclusion. Any other suggested, any other suggested edits? Okay, and with that amendment, do we have a second? Second. I think seconded, we, yes. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Five zero, thank you. Okay, moving on to our third item on the agenda, the administrative update from our interim executive director, Karen Watts. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Good morning. Uh, there's just a few things I'd like to uh, just bring to your attention this morning. Uh, one, as I, I know you're aware, but just wanted to highlight, uh, the racing bill did pass. Uh, that was signed on January 13th. Uh, that is significant because the previous law, which was the Chapter 47 of the Acts of 2019, extended the authorization for racing and simulcasting until January 15th. So they made it with two days to spare. Uh, this extension authorizes racing and simulcasting through July 1st of 2020. So that'll give the legislature and interested parties a, an opportunity to work out what they want to do going forward. Uh, just one uh, interesting aside is that the bill became chapter one of the acts of 2020. So we found that was First notable. First Easy to remember. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, the other thing I wanted to mention to the commissioners, just something that's going on within the agency, uh, is the, the Play My Way rollout at EBH and at MGM. Uh, pursuant to an MOU with the operators, uh, they had signed an MOU in, in September of 2018 indicating that the rollout of the program at the two uh, resort destination casinos was scheduled for September 20th. Uh, we are currently on track to meet that deadline. Uh, the gaming lab and the IT team is working closely with both IGT and EBH and MGM to implement the program. They're in the process of completing the connection to the IGT Advantage system with Play My Way. And once the team completes the connection, the gaming technical compliance team uh, will begin testing and we estimate it will take two to three weeks to complete. Uh, so I spoke with Scott, that is something that they'll have uh, the testing and they'll be working in the lab. If any of the commissioners want to check that out or see how the testing uh, is being implemented, I can recommend checking with Scott to see, you know, a good time and, and go in there and see how it actually is working in the testing, because it is very interesting. It is a really significant accomplishment by this commission and the partners at, at the casinos and through IGT, and it's, it's been a very successful program. Uh, so if you have any questions on that, you can speak to either, you know, Mark, Katrina, uh, Scott, or myself, and we can give you further updates, but I just wanted to highlight that that was going on, and it's uh, something that's on track for that implementation date of September of 2020. Can I mention just one yeah. thing, and this is something I had told, uh, I have spoken with uh, Scott and uh, Mark, uh, but it's something I look forward to when, um, when I take up on the your suggestion of um, looking at the testing. And, and that is that um, we were um, assuming and, and we we're uh, re requesting that there will be some ability to configure that new platform. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps for, for others, um, the, the initial platform, Play My Way, in, um, in Plain Ridge was rolled out and it's, um, shall we say, it's set. There's no ability to now change unless, unless we undertake a major software re, um, uh, effort. Um, uh, there's no ability to, let's say, change some of the, the way some of the questions are asked. Um, 
Since then, we've learned a number of things about what people struggle with when they're signing up and what people like um, and some of the features. And uh, the overall, the catch-all, the lesson learned in, in, in my view was so long as we had the ability to configure some of the new platform, mm -hmm. it was going to be very helpful. So before, um, I, I, I think those were the, mm -hmm. uh, the marching orders, if you will, that was yep. the understanding. It's just something that I think we should check. Okay. okay. The other thing I, I just wanted to highlight for the commission, because sometimes you know things go on and there's operations you may not uh, be intricately aware of. And one thing that just I noticed and this is more in the IEB director uh, hat that I'm wearing, that we have had a really successful partnership uh, with another state agency in DOR. So as you may be aware, when applicants um, are evaluated for suitability, uh, there's a financial integrity component to that. And one thing that we look at is, you know, have you been paying your taxes? Are you complying with that? And when uh, we did the opening for PPC, uh, that a, a lot of the troopers did a lot of the work on that and checking with DOR and making sure that was, uh, that was appropriate. Uh, since that time, so in 2016, DOR implemented a program where you could go online and get a certificate of good standing with DOR, which has been effective for us, and I would suggest also for the applicant and the Commonwealth in, in how this is, is being implemented. Uh, it's more efficient for us because we ask for a certificate of good standing on the front end. So as far as efficiencies and timing, as far as turnover for the investigations, that was extremely helpful. When there were issues to work out with DOR, it would take the state police a long time sometimes to figure that out. So now it's done on the front end. And the way that DOR has implemented it is that they really work with the applicant to move a path forward. So it's not as if you have to pay everything all up front, all right away in order to get your job. They just enter into, you know, if you've got a, a deficiency or there's a problem, they work out a program, so even if you're paying a small amount, as long as you're working towards it, they will give you the certificate of good standing. So it helps the Commonwealth because if there's, there's money that needs to be collected, it's done, but you get the person the job. Is for, instead of saying, nope, can't get the job, you know, you've got this problem. So it's just a win-win all around, and a lot of times, you know, we hear about programs that are implemented, especially online or technical things that, that may have uh, bugs in them or problems, but this one really worked out very well as far as the um, rollout. I myself went in to test it. It was minutes for me to just get the certificate of good standing. So uh, that's been a, a helpful thing, and plus, uh, the applicant can get assistance to work out how they want to resolve this, particularly with the you know, lower level employee that might need some help. It's, it's something that now is not a barrier to entry for the jobs. So that's been uh, just something I wanted to highlight for the commission. It seems to coincide with the commission's directive. Yes, we want to protect integrity, but we want to get people to work. So that was something I just wanted to mention uh, and also commend DOR because the, the program really rolled out well you know, it, for, and for us, and I think other state agencies are using it as well. So it's been a success. So I just wanted to highlight that for you because that may be, not be something you know about you know, in your day-to-day -day operation as commissioners. Um, that's, that's really good, good news, yeah. obviously, and um, I like when state government cooperates with yeah. one another. Yep. Um, did we make the suggestion that this would be helpful or no, they? No, they, they worked on it on their, they, they had already been in, in process. It oh, they something, had. Take, you know, something like that. It was a big undertaking uh, and it worked out really well, I don't know. Great. Is there any other comments on that? Well, I appreciate you bringing this uh, to our attention and to the public's attention because it is a collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of collaboration. I also like that you mentioned how internally mm -hmm. um, the uh, Play My Way project really is, mm -hmm. you know, it's originated by our statutory obligation, implemented by the, the expertise of Mark, mm -hmm. but, you know, it takes, it takes the entire team. Right. And so thank you for bringing that up. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, the other mm -hmm. thing I just, uh, just to put on uh, your, your radar screen and also to remind the public is that January 31st is the deadline for the Community Mitigation Fund application. So just another reminder for anyone that's out there listening or is going to watch the video and just for your, your, uh, yourselves to be aware that uh, that's coming down the pike. So just wanted a reminder on that. 
Uh, and then as far as going forward on these administrative updates, we'd have some discussion about what you'd like to see. Um, one thing we talked about is sort of highlighting things in, in the different divisions. Um, and I've spoken to Katrina about uh, the IT, so the CIO giving just some information and you know, a, a sort of a, a briefing on sort of what's going on in their shop. Uh, so my expectation is that will be at the next meeting. So uh, I don't know if the commissioners have any other comments, other things they'd like to see or other information they'd like from me as the interim executive director, but I'm happy to accommodate any requests for any information you'd like to see at these meetings. That'll, that'll probably be a work in progress, yeah. but and thank you. You can speak offline too. Okay. Okay. So in our agenda setting meeting, uh, of course, is a public meeting and it was very rigorous last week. So thank you uh, for that too. So that's, that, that concludes my general update. If, any, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Before we turn to uh, your update on the, the Region C matter, I just want to point out that you know, this is um, a matter that we've been addressing since the fall in different different fashions. You know, the, the Gaming Commission is privileged because we have such a thoughtful, comprehensive law that the legislature uh, crafted and the governor passed, um, Governor Patrick passed in 2011, that really serves as, as a roadmap. It's thoughtful and it's thorough. Um, <clears throat> our obligation is to meet those obligations and to fulfill our statutory and, quite frankly, our fiduciary responsibilities. Um, our obligation with respect to uh, a Category 1 license in Region C is really twofold. We'd have to consider, of course, the interests in the of and the impacts on Region C. And we also have to consider the interests of and impacts on the Commonwealth. It's a complex matter. And so we have asked for some guidance uh, from, the, from the public and, and stakeholders and interested parties through perhaps an issuance of an RFI and the issuance of a request for public comments. We do that because in order to do our jobs, we know we have to be as informed as we can be. We make no presumptions about our own expertise. You know, what better way to become informed about such an important matter than to reach out to all the, uh, the public members who have an interest and the experts that we know could respond and, and make sure that any action we take is an informed action. There may be folks who believe that our decision-making process which might include the issuance of the RFI today, is process that's unnecessary, cumbersome, and is time consuming. I don't speak for my fellow commissioners, they can chime in, but I do speak from uh, what I understand our responsibilities are, and that it is due diligence that would be done in any other setting and so it is not simply time-consuming process. It is thoughtful, and it would be um, <clears throat> the proper uh, information gathering that one would do in any other setting, the due diligence that's required to make an informed decision. So I just set that a stage and offer any insight you um, may want to offer now, or we'll wait for your presentation. But we are today at a certain decision-making point um, and, and uh, one which we understand also the need to be deliberate, but that doesn't mean slow. That means deliberate, careful, methodical, smart. Any comments, suggestions? Okay, so I'll, I'll go ahead. So the uh, one matter for the Commission's uh, consideration this morning, so staff has been working with the commissioners with their input from the last meeting uh, to draft an RFI proposal to be posted uh, as a preliminary, preliminary matter. I really would like to thank, uh, you know, Attorney Grossman, uh, Derek Lennon, John Ziamba, and Mary Thurlow, who really worked hard to make sure that the Commission's comments were incorporated, uh, that the whole um, 
uh, document made sense, and, and they really uh, came together, were a good team. Again, you know, emphasizing teamwork and, and different parts of the agency working together on a project, this is another good example. So the, uh, the document is in your packet, and you've had a chance to review it. Uh, we do have, um, you know, we have the introduction which sort of lays out, um, you know, what, what the commission is looking at. So the, the, uh, the landscape there gives an overview of Region C, the proposed questions uh, that we are looking for answers to in response to the RFI, and then sort of the, uh, the administrative process to respond. So at this point, uh, if the commissioners have any uh, comments or any changes you'd like to make, we can make those, um, and uh, hopefully if the commission's comfortable, we have a, a, a limited number of changes, and we don't need to come back before the commission, you could vote on it today with the Scrivener's position, uh, provision that we could you know, make small alterations. But that would be the expectation. If you're comfortable with this or some minor changes, we could go forward with the process and then issue the RFI. But it's up to the commission uh, how comfortable they are with the document. I would just say um, I'm, I'm happy to take the step we need to take to move ahead and issue this RFI. Um, just a quick note, obviously, Commissioner Zuniga gave some very detailed questions. I like how you were able to fold them in underneath our broader questions. Um, for me, uh, just reviewing it again last night, and it's really just a wordsmithing suggestion. Uh, but on page seven, uh, question nine, it says, given the context of the Massachusetts gaming market, uh, when would be the best time instead of four? Uh, I would just suggest when would be the best time to conduct a Regency gaming market study. So simple wordsmithing more than anything else. But I think the rest of it looks good. Any objection to that? Edit? No, it makes sense. No, any best time to conduct. Okay. We can issue I, that. I did have an edit on uh, page three. Yep. At the end of, towards the end of the page. Yes. Uh, the total capital investment of those three licenses, and we're talking about two category ones and one category two, resulted in a total of, the amount is actually 3.85 billion. I think, I think that, that was clarified, yeah, by but, John. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Ziemba is in the room. Mr. Ziemba is in the back of the room. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so I think that you're right. It was changed. It was the 3.8 that we've seen, but there was uh, some methodology that, that um, the yeah, team the, applied. Yeah, the, the costs that are excluded from the minimum capital investment then. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So can, <clears throat> as long we'll, as Commissioner we'll, Zuniga nope, gets comfortable. that's fine. You're comfortable? Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, maybe we can just footnote that these that exclude right. certain costs that we have that's decided to exclude. Okay. That's a good idea. Either good. as a footnote or not. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And and if, and I would be comfortable with a, any kind of a clarifying footnote if you'd like that. Mm -hmm. I think that makes good sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 No. That's that. I'm, I'm glad that was that mm -hmm. thought. Okay. To reconcile that. Any other suggestions or edits? I guess um, the one thing that's outstanding is the time frame. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Uh, I think that we don't probably need to nail down exact dates today, but I do think uh, at one point certain or a number of months that were suggested that it might be required to conduct the RFI. I think I messaged to Mr. Lennon at the time that seemed like a long time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we want to make sure we give enough time to make it a productive response because some of these questions are very substantive in nature. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I defer to our team, you know, your, uh, uh, Derek and everyone else who would be uh, working on the RFI and issuing mm -hmm. it to, to think about those states, but I suspect you can get input from the fellow commissioners as appropriate okay. um, on it. My, my hope is that we're, we're aware of, of it needing to be timely. Okay. So are there any outside parameters, any concern? I mean, obviously, we don't want 
this document out for a year, but uh, is there any, any general guidance you want to give now or we should just consult with you individually and you're directing us to, to come up with yeah. the time, the, the uh, submission deadline? Um, Does anyone recall what the best practice or the typical practice timeline was that Derek Clement suggested? I was going to say that there's a 45-day in my mind, mind um, time frame that usually applies for RFRs, I believe. An RFP, is this a, RFI, RFPs, and this is an RFI, RFI, so. Yeah. I mean, it, we, there's no necessarily a guideline, but, you know, 45 days acts, uh, acts in my view, as some kind of, you know, uh, anchor for us. Okay. Um, the, I, if I recall, oh, the 45 days is for um, to comply with World Trade Organization. I think that that wouldn't you necessarily that? apply to an RFI. I, I know it doesn't. Right. No, but just getting the right. I'm just, where that I'm just, from. I'm just throwing right. out a framework, a, yeah. a framework that right. may right. be guiding. Yeah. Okay. Instinctively, uh, given my experience, you know, I'd say four to six weeks would be probably a, a, an, a enough time to get meaningful responses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, uh, you know, days. in the 45 days is not outside that. Mm -hmm. uh, Derek may say it could even be shorter, but I don't, I don't know without Derek being here. Okay. So, well, I'll, I I'll consult with the team, and then we can just check in individually to see if there's any any. I think if, so. If we move forward on the assumption that we're 45 days is the jumping off point, and the question is, do you make it do you all shorter or longer? longer? Do you make sure. it any shorter? Yeah, right. okay. that's really the question. All right, that's helpful. Outside, so yeah. that that I can work with the staff and come up with a good date. So that that's extremely helpful. Okay. I yeah. I would just add, I think. You know, having a, a, a dynamic communications plan around this. I mean, us mm -hmm. just putting it Pushing out on combines yeah. may not right. get the attraction of the people that we want to see it. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously, you know, making folks aware of it either through gaming industry media or what have mm -hmm. you, I think, might attract a little more attention than just saying it's going to be up on combines. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. All right. All right. We'll implement that. So. Given there's only two edits, if the commission votes on this today, I, could, I expect this will be up shortly. Should we vote on the two uh, documents together? Um, I have one comment on the request for public comments. That's on the next section. Mm -hmm. well, why, or do you want to separate? Well, why don't, uh, if I can make a suggestion, why don't we discuss the public comments and you decide whether or not you want to make the vote together or exactly. separately? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That sounds good. So as you uh, see in your packet, pursuant to ongoing conversations and with feedback from, feedback from the last meeting, right now we have the uh, suggested uh, five questions in the format you see in your packet. Uh, if you uh, have any further suggestions or comments or additions or deletions, we can do that now and then make a decision on whether or not to post that simultaneously with the RFI or timing-wise what the Commission wants to do. I just wanted to point out one thing, as I had asked for the uh, one, two, three, the fourth bullet to shift to the RFI. The fact that it's du duplicative is okay too, but I just wanted to point out, I thought it was more technical and, and maybe should be in the RFI. I just wanted to, to mention in case you had missed it in the, in the okay. RFI. Yeah, I had that, that okay. same thought. Question number four does appear currently in the RFI and, you know, obviously we invite uh, residents of Massachusetts to comment on anything they want to, but it seemed to me to be more of a technical question, which may be more properly addressed by somebody in the RFI. Okay. Yeah, I agree, especially the notion of obtaining financing. I mean, mm -hmm. if it was at least broader, you know, we may get, but I, I think the other questions address the, 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 broader, the, one. the, the, the exactly. broader ones. Exactly. Okay. No, I would agree with that. And just from a consistency standpoint, just enumerating them instead of just the blank bullets, yep. just so that it can make a reference back to what the person is giving comment on is going to be easier for us. Yeah. Okay, good that's point. good. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay, so we'll take out question four, that's easy. Hmm. That's basically uh, incorporated in the, duplicate. The, in the hmm. RFI. Okay, any other comments? Yeah, just one, and, and Karen, you and I talked about this this morning. Um, question number five, or the last bullet. Um, I think that's a question, uh, that we ourselves should answer. Um, I think we've all expressed a willingness, kind of keeping with our tradition of transparency, that we would conduct a public hearing. We already know that 
if we were to move to a, an application process, we have a surrounding community and a host community agreement, uh, or a host community public hearing, but you know, I would say we answer that question for ourselves. We do agree that we would hold a public hearing prior to reopening Region C. Um, uh, you know, in the timing for that, maybe when we get feedback from an RFI or if we go to the RFR process, but I would say we answer that for ourselves. I think we commit ourselves to having a public hearing. Again, question of time. Um, I would like to also suggest adding a question, um, and it's more of a wrap-up question at the end, would be what other factors or issues do you think the Commission should consider or address if Region C is reopened for a commercial gaming license. That's a good idea because it doesn't, it may not fit into one of the questions uh, asked. So that wrap up question I like. Um, I agree. Um, uh, we've always had public hearings uh, in advance of any, any major decision we make. Um, so I, I'm, I'm supportive of your suggestion. Okay. I just expect the public may tell us the answer that we, we mm -hmm. we'd all likely be willing to do anyways. I think we'd have to be strategic on where we have it because we didn't, we wouldn't want it in. But um, are, are, are you suggesting we conduct a hearing, a public hearing to see if we open the region or not? Because what we've had in the past are public hearings after we had received uh, applications. Uh, mm -hmm. So we had already opened uh, the bidding. We had done a lot of suitability and there had been a, a vote and et cetera, et cetera. And frankly, those were dictated by statute. I, I am not sure that a public hearing on, as to whether to reopen uh, the bidding uh, may be um, a, a foregone conclusion. I just wanted to note that that's the difference in, from the past. I, I, I only recommend we have a public hearing prior to making a decision and at the same time we might have information we can share with the public that we glean from the RFI process or glean from the RFR process. That's fine. So I, I leave it up to a question of timing. I'm just thinking we don't need to include the question if yeah, I would Some agree with that as well. We would and, uh, have a hearing uh, it is a little bit different, but I think the region has been a little bit different than the others. So um, uh, any opportunity to get public input, I think, is 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 a, that's fine. A good thing. Yeah, I do think it was contemplated more contextually with either results from an RFI or a draft or something like that to be part of an agenda that possibly then we would do as we've done in the past at maybe down in Plainville, so that there was a, sort of a geographic access point for people in Regency closer to here if they did if there was some reason an opportunity to have public comment at that point. But I agree with you, it doesn't necessarily need to be open to public comment now and what we're putting out. I actually think it's a, a very good point because I, I do believe we anticipate, anticipated uh, if we decide to proceed uh, through whatever direction we, we give ourselves or through the information we receive from the public was to probably go to Regency to learn more just so that folks who may not answer questions in writing or have a easy access to us. So I think that's a really a, a, a good insight. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and from Commissioner Zuniga's input, it looks like we do have some strategy um, questions to think about. So. And I, in terms of the, the um, last point, it's more pers sort of perspective and I think that's fine too. Yeah. I think there's a counter question, uh, what are the, factors we have to consider if we we didn't too but I think that's captured enough in the RFI you know what are the implications of both decisions so um, I know we also need to figure out a deadline for comment to submission obviously we take comments or submissions at any time um, but it may make sense to align it with the RFI deadline for the time being I, always I extend it if we had to right Agreed. Okay. Yeah. That's, and that and, and it can even be explained because Bruce has brought up the point we always welcome input. So in this case, it, the timeline, because we are seeking parallel okay. information pursuant to a request for information, and then we'll have aligned input.
Any further suggestions with either document? And unless uh, Mr. Grossman objects, we could consolidate a vote on both sure. both documents. So my, just to clarify, my understanding is that commission seems to be in agreement that uh, we keep questions one, two, and three, take out questions four and five, and add the question at the end, what other factors or issues do you think the commission should consider or address if Regency is reopened for a commercial gaming license? And then we'd number the questions. Is that fair assessment? Is yes. it great. If we reopen or whether to reopen? If. I have if Regency is okay. So that's why it was more perspective. Right. as opposed to whether. See, number one is should we consider reopening? Mm -hmm. okay. So then what happens if, and that was my point was, you know, there's actually implications for action and inaction. In so mm -hmm. do you want to amend that? Or do you want no. to just keep it? No. I'm, fine I'm, fine with, I'm fine with that perspective. Mm -hmm. so yeah, the so weather these, is already addressed. These are the factors if the, if the commission decides yeah, to reopen. Right. Yes. Yes. Good with that. Mm -hmm. okay. Any further questions, discussion, clarifications? Do we have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I'd move the commission move forward with the posting of the version of the R request for information, RFI, and a request for public comment as included in the commissioner's packet and as amended uh, and discussed here today. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero, and that would include the Scrivener's provisions for any edits. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, of course. Thank, thank you so much. It's in the motion. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for the work on that, including Mary, who I don't see here, but She's not surprisingly, great. Mary was involved. So yes. thank you. <laughs> okay, moving on to item number four. We have um, Ms. Wells in her other role, along with uh, my fellow commissioners, Commissioner O'Brien and Commissioner Zuniga, on a very important matter with a June deadline, the um, license renewal process for Plain Ridge Park Casino. So I, I generally will turn this over to Commissioner Zuniga for a briefing on this. From the uh, IB, IEB's perspective, licensing has gone forward with the, the renewal process on the suitability provision. So that's in process where uh, uh, Mr. Curtis is working with Loretta Lilios on that and connected, has connected with the uh, licensee on that process. So that's moving forward. Um, yeah, let me just, uh, perhaps we can do a little tag team here if I um, omit uh, or summarize too much uh, some of the steps here, uh, along with Commissioner um, O'Brien and, uh, and John, if, um, if we can all, um, Talk about this, but you should all, uh, you should all have received should have received uh, a memo that came from um, uh, Todd um, in terms of describing some of the process. Uh, it is not included in the packet, but I'll speak to some of the general ideas that were that are part of that, and uh, and that is in general that um, we will begin to form a a record by requesting of. Uh, of PPC uh, a number of documents and reviewing some documents and aspects on site. Uh, really that process already started as Karen was saying uh, um, with the suitability update and review. There's some additional qualifiers and that has already uh, started. Um, John and the team has proposed that uh, the staff start meeting with PPC on a monthly basis. Um, that the first meeting would probably, are they looking to try to um, effectuate by either next week or shortly after? Um, and that is really to go through um, the aspects that are going to be reviewed. In, in general, I will summarize as a compliance review, um, and that has any number of different um, uh, aspects and topics towards that. Um, an examination of the commitments um, that uh, PPC has done and, and, and how that has, uh, those commitments have been um, uh, 
uh, accomplished, uh, complied with, or modified uh, as necessary. Um, and an examination of the financial uh, condition of the, of the property. One that will be done um, likely on site because a lot of those uh, materials are uh, already subject of a non-disclosure agreement. Um, and um, we'll have uh, some of our team of um, financial investigators and others uh, look at some of the reports and, um, um, and financials that, that there are on site. Um, we expect that um, as the date comes closer to June 27, which is when the license expires, um, there will probably be more, sub, more uh, frequent meetings, uh, not unlike what we went through prior to the opening, uh, or like we, we went through um, in the opening. There may be every two weeks or, you know, depending on how some of the document becomes, begins to arrive uh, back from, from Penn. Um, we will hold, and that's the suggestion to, to uh, something that we spoke about before, we will hold a, a public hearing, um, and much like we do uh, for the renewals of uh, racing, uh, every time uh, there's, there's a license uh, renewal there, this is very similar. Uh, we'll notify uh, the public, um, some of the stakeholders locally, certainly, um, and um, we'll probably go to Plainridge, um, like we've done in the past on racing, um, and hope to hear from, um, from the members of the public and others. Um, we could probably target that to be around May, but, uh, but there's not any set date necessarily. Um, a lot of uh, the, uh, the documents, uh, the, when, when we had the public hearings in the past, uh, there was a timing element that, uh, that was prescribed in the statute. We don't have that in this case. You remember that we had in our regulations um, an opportunity for the host community agreement to be posted, uh, voted, and then we conducted the hearing. Um, this really doesn't operate uh, in, in this relicensing case. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, the suitability review has uh, commenced. Um, there, it's, uh, there, there's a lot uh, that we've done also recently in terms of the commitments review and, uh, and the compliance review because we did the midterm examination. A lot of those commitments were updated, uh, but this is yet again another opportunity to, to refresh or update any. Uh, as we continue uh, this process. Um, I suspect the same members of the staff that have been involved in those prior um, efforts, John and Joe in the case of commitments, and perhaps even Mary, uh, everybody from IEB in the suitability, et cetera, um, will continue to have that, um, that involvement. And um, in order to make full uh, uh, one question that I was that I'm bringing today is um, the involvement of commissioners in any one aspect of this uh, review. Uh, when we first had uh, the licensing uh, process, we divided ourselves in different groups, and that enabled each of us to have a role in examining um, that that part. You'll remember the finance category, the mediation, uh, etc. Although these are not the same categories, um, we could conceivably, if my fellow commissioners desired, be involved uh, in the review of uh, whatever discipline, so long as there was not, not uh, you know, um, an overlay of, of, of that review, because that would happen uh, on, a, on a public meeting. In other words, if we if we were interested in each taking a particular um, segment of any of these review, um, we could organize ourselves uh, accordingly. That's a question I wanted to kind of bring, bring here today. Um, I, I, I hadn't thought of that, yeah. and um, I'm just not sure of the applicability. Uh -huh. um, so I, I'd really need to take some time and 
try to try to understand uh, how that would happen. It's a, it, to me, it's a very different process than than the initial suitability. Um, but I, I'm, I would like to take a look and talk Fair about enough. it. Um, this was just something for us to ponder. Sure. Um, we will, all of us, have uh, the opportunity to see and get an update, you know, at, before we making the decision with ample time. Uh, I should also uh, mention that uh, one of the first, the first meeting uh, that we will, that we are, are, are having uh, as early as next week, um, is one in which we will uh, present Penn with a number of um, documents to be updated. The form, a form that we've spoken about in the past, um, you know, the current status of certain um, um, commitments, etc. And we need to give them enough time to put that together and, and come back. So, um, as soon as you know this this next week, uh, a lot of the um, the work turns into um, into pen to begin compiling that information. Um, I also wanted to bring up um, one question uh, that is not necessary. It's, it's not necessary to be resolved today, but I may have spoken about it in the past, and that is relative to the fee. Um, the statute, and I, I may need the exact citation, uh, Todd, if you want to, if you're able to look that up. Um, but the statute contemplates a licensing fee of no less for Category Two, of no less than a hundred thousand dollars, which is what we've spoken about um, as, um, you know, as what we would mark as the benchmark. Um, it also says that it is intended to deflect or defray the costs of investigations and um, an examination of this relicensing process. And it is perhaps not, it is perhaps uh, easy to assume that um, with all the staff time that we will um, um, incur in this process, we may uh, incur you know, that amount of cost in terms of staff costs. The conflict uh, that I wanted to bring up with is that then the statute goes on to say that the, the licensing fee, that fee, is to be deposited in the gaming revenue fund, which is a different fund from where we pay for our costs. That would be the gaming um, control fund. Um, and so um, this is not a matter that we need to resolve today uh, necessarily, but um, we have alerted uh, Pen that the initial fee will be uh, a minimum of $100,000 um, that will be payable prior to June 27th or 24th. Um, but we need to figure out whether to deposit it in the gaming control fund uh, or in the gaming revenue fund. Um, it's, it, Is that a matter of our discretion? Well, it's a matter of conflict in the statute. And um, there's... Yeah, but is that because of how the funds get directed or is it on that, uh, I mean, because we're concerned about where the funds get directed or what does the statute actually direct us to do? It directs us to do two things that are at odds. Um, I understand that's the point. that tension. So uh, because of the covering of the costs, I understand that component. But in terms of where funds actually could go, um, regardless of how they're used, what is it? So the statute, it's, it's section 20F of chapter 23K. It says that the commission um, shall establish procedures for renewal and set the renewal fee based on the cost of fees associated with the evaluation of a licensee. Notably, it doesn't say we should keep those costs. It just says we shall set the fee based on the cost. Now, the presumption, of course, is that we should keep them. Uh, and that's why the fee should be set based on what it costs us to evaluate. Understanding as a backdrop how our budget is set and where we get uh, our monies, our funding from, uh, being from the licensees, of course, that all the money we take in um, from them uh, goes to finance our operations. So uh, the, the theory, presumably, uh, when it comes to us conducting evaluations and investigations and whatnot would be that we should assess the cost of specific investigations on the entity that's being investigated because it would be 
presumptively unfair to assess those costs to all licensees uh, for one, uh, based uh, because we're, uh, we're evaluating one specific entity. That's the, the general theory, I would I'd suggest, behind our whole budget. And so they said here, when you're just evaluating one licensee, that when you set the renewal fee, it should be based upon the cost associated with the evaluation of the licensee. It, again, it doesn't say we should keep that money. It, then it goes on to say that any renewal fees shall be deposited into the gaming revenue fund, which as Commissioner Zuniga points out, is not uh, a fund for which we have access to the fees. But so, the statute does t direct us to go to that's, a particular It's very clear. Fund. It yeah. says that the fees shall be deposited into that fund. And the guidance so, is about amount. It does, I understand the practical tension and that was clear beforehand, but the statute does direct the funds to a particular fund that just would not accomplish the practical tension. Very, yes, that, that's exactly right. I think it's also important to bear in mind, and we pointed this out in the memo, that there are a number of levers that the commission can pull to ensure that we are made whole for any uh, investigations or uh, analyses, and including uh, provision of the statute that uh, we haven't looked at in quite some time. It's section 56A, which discusses the $600 per slot machine annual assessment. And it says after five years, the commission can reassess that fee and determine how much it should be. So there are ways we could adjust the assessment upon uh, any particular licensee if you were to determine that the renewal fee has to be deposited into the gaming revenue fund, as the statute suggests. The, the, there are, so there are a couple things that are clear, though. The, the fee has to be at least $100,000, and it, certainly, any, certainly any excess over and above uh, the amount it costs to investigate or analyze the application would have to be deposited into the gaming revenue fund. Um, but otherwise, there is perhaps a tension in the statute that you should certainly resolve in advance of us assessing the fee. I don't know if the legislature can work that fast. <laughs> well, we, I mean, obviously they won't do that, but we would need to make a determination as to what the statute means and attempt to read it in harmony um, in order to reach what we believe the intent of the legislation mm -hmm. was. I, I happen to think that um, it would be, um, I, I just, we just, we, we needed to highlight this, this tension as, as, uh, as. So it seems as though we need additional guidance on this point. I think we weren't going to vote on it today because right. I, I don't, um, I do want to hear from Commissioner O'Brien on this, um, on the process as well, uh, but in terms of where there is statutory language that seems quite black and white in terms of where revenues must be deposited. Um, we want to you know, exercise proper care around that. But uh, I also would want to know about best practices in terms of, of the amount and, and also if we're able to estimate how much it's likely to cost internally. Um, so I don't know if that's that's just my well. My I, my guess I don't I don't I have not done numbers necessarily, and this is a good um, uh, exercise to try to estimate. Uh, but but my guess was that the cost of investigating them were going to exceed uh, hundred thousand um, dollars. This came up. We, there is a manner in which IAB tracks. Yes. How the so, cost is associated uh, with um, I will have one caveat that because this is a um, modified protocol for the renewal. You know, if you compared it, you can't compare it to the initial suitability. The initial suitability would have been clearly over $100,000. But given that we have the renewal protocol and comparing that, we, you know, we've looked, spoken internally and looked at some other vendors that you might compare it to, you just in, in the amount of qualifiers and the amount of investigation, uh, I don't know, I, I think it would be less. So. You, are you including the staff time of That's others? That's what I'm not including. Not just the so investigation? You'd remember, you have the investigation piece, but you also have all the other pieces, which uh, I don't know the number on that, but um, well, you know, you've got 
Mr. Ziemba's time. You've got mm -hmm. uh, you know other individuals who would be working on the renewal. Uh, you've got Joe's time. So, if you include that, you know, plus the investigation, yeah, I'm guessing you probably at least hit the hundred thousand. But I would have to check to make sure. Are you able to uh, use that same tool and apply it to? staff outside of IEB? Well, we'd have to see what the process would be. I so see. what we do is uh, we do a blended rate and then investigators track hours. Uh, so we have that mechanism which we could have staff use for, um, for the renewal process to track the amount of time. Now projecting it is different right. than re retrospective. Right. Yeah, no, I'm, you know, so here's, here's one thing, if it's less, the statute says it's a minimum of 100,000. Right. So in my view, that's, that's easy. Um, if it's more, the question is, you know, what do we do with, well, if it's exactly that or more, the question is what do we do with the, where, where do we deposit the, the 100,000? And the plain read of the statute, by the way, would direct us to put it in the um, gaming revenue fund. Um, and we continue to assess our licensees for all of our costs proportionately. I think it would be helpful if we could try to have a projection. You know, thinking about what staff would be um, important pieces to get, the, to get this done properly and, you know, just, I know it's any projection is just that, but, um, but I think that would be helpful. You know, as, as we've been talking here, uh, uh, Todd also mentioned um, uh, the question, policy slash legal question as to uh, our, author our ability to raise the $600 per machine assessment. Um, I, would, I would say there are at least, there's another, there's, there's this question as to where to deposit the, uh, the funds. Uh, and there's a third one um, that we, we were discussing the other time, and that is whether there is a requirement um, on the relicensing of Penn that they continue to conduct racing. Um, there is a clear language in the statute uh, for the first licensing period uh, that if, if anybody has been a racing licensee and become a gaming licensee, uh, they have to retain uh, and con conducting racing. Um, this is a, a matter of legal question. If they and, and one that we could also ask Penn as part of this process, what are your intentions um, as you get relicensed? Um, but we could conceivably take these three legal questions together and try to resolve, you know, in the near future uh, as we continue to undertake um, the process of examination in parallel. Just to be clear um, for me, the dollars go into the fund, and the concern is strictly that the other licensees would be absorbing some of the costs related to the license, renewal licensing process of PPC, and that's strictly it. We would be able to cover our costs. It's not as though it's going to the outside of our operating dollars. It's just that it's the sharing component. Mm -hmm. And it is not lost on me that the legislature could have contemplated that that was an okay cost for everyone to share because everyone at a certain point would be likely up for renewal rather than necessarily each absorbing those dollars. It, 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 that, while it may seem like it, it's either a conflict or a mistake, that could have been something that they may have said, you know, cover it, but it's okay for the sharing because that is the single question here. So if we do read and we do have you know, the obligation to comply with the statute. Um, I don't necessarily know if our, our um, concerns as a regulator about the, that sharing or the equity of that sharing was necessarily adopted by the legislature. I don't know if there's any legislative history on that particular matter, but I don't necessarily believe that they may have had said that um, you know, because the fee should reflect costs, that it didn't, does not necessarily follow, that means they couldn't share those costs. That's right. right. Essentially, that right? we would just pay for the cost of the evaluation out of our budget. Right. And it would be fine. 
But that is the that is the issue. I wanted to make sure I wasn't missing that the dollars went outside to a different fund that we couldn't no. access. Okay, great. Thank you. I this, I'm not trying to over uh, to um, to complicate matters more, but um, for background, um, the initial fees and they were really substantial. They were 85 million for. Mm -hmm. Uh, for category one and 20, 20 or 25 million? 25. 25 million for category two. They uh, were directed into the gaming licensing fund. That was an entirely different fund um, that had a number of uses, and that fund expired. Uh, you, know, at, at, you know, since we, since, uh, um, since we were uh, conceived. Um, so there was a clear presumption that a licensing fee in the future would not go in the same manner to different, you know, to different funds, and that adds color to this discussion, at least in my view. Um, but again, it would be, in my opinion, harder to go against a very clear directive of where to deposit the funds. In this case, the gaming revenue fund. Before, before we move on to all of our questions about this process, I do want to hear from Commissioner O'Brien to supplement, clarify any of the process. Uh, the only clarification would be that one of the things uh, I pointed it out that was while everyone presumes that Penn wants to renew their license and it's been a successful relationship and no one should presume anything, and then in terms of actually kicking off the recitation of what's required, the process, the fees, et cetera, there has to be some overture from them. Uh, in writing saying that they want to renew it. And so part of what this process is also going to entail is just that trigger, is mm -hmm. that once there is a clarification from us to Penn of these are the requirements, this is the timing, this is the expectation, there would be an expectation of confirmation back from, the, from Penn that they want to go forward. Mm -hmm. But everything else in terms of the questions raised, the process that was laid out by Commissioner Zuniga is, you know, my understanding of how this is going to proceed. Yeah, we did discuss that, thank you. Uh, and we may have already either um, advised them that that would be necessary, or maybe they have already responded that they are they intend to. Uh, maybe they really need to do it in writing, and we, we establish a record, as you say. Right. But they, they clearly intend to. Questions, comments from um, you, Commissioner Stebbins, and Commissioner Cameron about the process yeah, just, outlined. I, I appreciate the update from our from our colleagues. Um, and obviously, some of the questions that are ahead of us. Um, the one thing I would want to raise uh, with respect to the public hearing, and I think Commissioner Zuniga, you brought this up before. It is not only looking at what Penn has done over the past five years, but giving them the opportunity to say what they will do during the next five-year term of their license. Uh, maybe answering the question about racing is included in that, but yep. um, you know the original application was looking at what they plan to do during the term of their license. I would like to give them the opportunity to say this is what we plan to do in the next term of our license. Mm -hmm. I think that's just as critically important. Agreed. Absolutely. Very good point. Yep. Good. We'll make that clear. I do not have additional questions. Thank you for the effort and time and thoughtful um, discussion about it's it. It's a team thoughtful effort. Process. Very thoughtful process. In terms of um, the public hearing, that prompted uh, my thinking about the timeline, and I know that um, John Ziamba and, and team are in, and I presume that both of you are working on a timeline that kind of starts backwards and goes forward, mm -hmm. That's just correct. so that everybody's expectations um, are, are informed and and so that the licensee can be timely, because it's not fair to them to short, shorten the time unnecessarily um, for them to deliver to us. In terms of the public hearing, the only um, caution I give is that it be sufficient, and it sounds like a May deadline would work, sufficient so that we can actually incorporate any public comments in, in a in, a, in both a timely fashion but a meaningful fashion. So if we get it too late, we may be down, we may be so far down the pike, we can't really undo some of our, um, our decision making. That's just a thought. I, I don't have a gut sense on that, but 
I was thinking at least timeline on it and enough time to be not to to make it meaningful. So, uh, <clears throat> and then on terms of feedback on the fee, obviously we have a, a a couple of legal questions on that, but also, as Commissioner Cameron mentioned, we would try to figure out if we can project the entire cost for the staff, and then. Um, if there are any, you did look at other jurisdictions, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't know if, if we end up doing any kind of a memo for the public, if that input could be included, that would be great. Yep. So that we have some you know, knowledge of what other jurisdictions are doing. Yeah, yeah, we've, that, that's been part of our prior discussions. So yeah, we, have, we, have, we have materials, really? yeah. It was, right. yeah. yeah, okay, yep. excellent. That was, that was a, mm -hmm. we can dig that up. And then on the horse racing piece, that sounds as though that's a critical piece for us to address. It's not an automatic condition of the renewal licensee, the license. Well, you're suggesting it, you, is it? Oh, sorry. Yeah, well, it occurs. It, it's, it's a legal question. It may be a little academic. Uh, it may be that, uh, of course, Penn intends to conduct racing. Um, I believe that. Um, um, this, if, 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 they, if there's a question as to whether the legal requirement is still there, it's clearly something that I would suggest we should impose as a condition of the next relicensing. Um, but again, something that, uh, that I wanted to highlight as, that as we look at all the, what we, everything we did in the past when we did the original licensing and why as to whether any of that still applies when we relicense, this was a, another another element for, for this kind of discussion. Mm -hmm. Can I ask, uh, if there were a legal decision that it's not legally required, could we learn if we have the power to exercise discretion and impose that condition? Well, I think we'll have to vet this a little more closely. Well, but no, not that's now, an open question, but I mean, I think. could yes, we include that course. as another legal question? Question it's an open question. I think we yep. talked about that. Okay. That what if it is an impossibility to satisfy through legislative act or lack thereof? What does that mean? Or, or do we have our, discretion? What's our authority? Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. What's our authority to exercise discretion one way or another? Okay. That would be really helpful. Uh, and I would submit that um, this would be the time to try to exercise it when we relicense somebody for another five years and establish um, a condition or not. Um, if we relicensed them, we didn't answer this question, and then later came to realize that you had no legal authority, they could be gone, for all, for all we know, racing that is. Um, I don't think, I'm not speaking on, 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 on behalf of Penn, I, it could be that it is clearly their intention to conduct it, and this may be a moot point, but it is a legal question that we should resolve, and if, and if it's not resolved, ex exercise uh, what we believe would be our authority. And, and the easiest one that occurs to me is to place an additional condition in, on, on the license. There's also the other question though, of legal impossibility to satisfy the condition, which I'm wondering if that's, that's what you what were I'm going at, at, which is if, because there's either action or inaction on the part of the general court on the legislation, what does that mean to any condition that we've imposed? Does it mm -hmm. then eradicate that condition? It exactly. Fair enough. Fair enough. We have to have no authority behind it. Right. So there's obviously some outstanding Plenty to chew on questions. <laughs> Got your list, Todd. Um, any further questions? And thank you. Thank you for helping. You know, we um, <clears throat> we have been briefed along the way uh, on the suitability, particularly in terms of uh, the ex whether we could achieve some efficiencies. We have that process underway, and so this is obviously a work in progress, but I think we should keep this on our agenda with some degree of cadence to answer these questions along, whether or not we have to have a formal vote, and we can um, and get just brief updates <coughs> so that we keep our cadence going. Yep. Okay, excellent, thank you. <coughs> Do you need a motion? We don't have a, a, a vote then necessarily today. You... Well, we had a provisional vote, and I believe there may have been a provisional motion, uh, but I, I, frankly, I don't know. I think if we have if a consensus need, today if, on. Yeah. I don't know that we need a vote to 
for IB and others to continue doing what yeah. they're doing. Yeah. Well, then, thank you. Moving on to item number four. Oh, number five, excuse me. Racing Division, Dr. Lightbound and Company. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Lightbound. If, you could, a, if no, you could make introductions, please. Oh, thank you. Um, I have uh, Chad Bork, our team, uh, senior financial analyst with us. And um, for the first couple of items, Steve O'Toole, the director of racing for um, Penn uh, Casino, is here to uh, help with any questions you may have. Um, what I might do is have uh, Steve go ahead and talk about the Winter Wonderland uh, Handicapping Contest, which is the um, item that's uh, 5A, and then um, if you have any questions, you can ask him, and, and Chad um, will actually um, talk to you about the promotional fund consideration. So, uh, Mr. O'Toole. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so, with the uh, promotional fund, we were kind of looking at different things that we could do, and one of the things that we have questions all the time from our customers is, you know, what, have you, what can you do for us uh, in terms of some type of uh, racing and, and so we do have our rewards that we uh, that we rolled out a couple years ago for our racing customers but um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the customers are very happy with the jackpots that you approved and that we've been able to offer and uh, a couple of those jackpots were hit over the course of the last uh, year or so to the tune of fifty and sixty thousand uh, dollars as they grew so that was really good um, one of the things that has kind of taken off over the years is some handicapping contests at other uh, at other tracks. And so ours is a little different than what, uh, there's a lot of different styles. The last one that we held was called a uh, survivor contest. So it, it went for a whole card one night um, on the Meadowlands and uh, Lenny Calderon, my announcer and, and public relations guy, he set it up. And so we identified the, the races at the Meadowlands and people would come in and they'd have their pick throughout all 10 races. And whoever survived to that last race uh, would be the winner. Unfortunately, the horse that won the first race paid $178 and only one person had it. So the contest didn't go on very long. <laughs> oh, wow. So, um, but it, it, it was a lot of, it, it, it did have a lot of excitement. So what we've done with this particular uh, contest is um, we're trying to push our rewards cards into more customers' hands. So with a rewards card or with a sign up for a rewards card, you're eligible for this contest, free of charge to, uh, to enter. And um, $5,000 in total prize money, $2,500 to the winner. This one's a little bit different. It's a, 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 a mythical $2 uh, wager, win, place, or show. And at the end of the races on, on Saturday, I, I don't have the date in front of me, but on the, on the contest day, uh, at the end, whoever um, has the highest mythical uh, uh, accumulation of winnings would be, the, would be the winner. And then we're gonna pay out to 10 places. So the, the contest, just, I'm just curious, um, so anybody picks all the races in the Meadowlands, and, but they're not betting on those races? It's just a contest among people that's, here? Right, that's separate. Yeah. They can go off and bet on their They can bet if they want to, but right. they don't. And we're hoping that they will. They'll, they'll, yeah. they'll, the, uh, most of the time, the customers and the patrons put in, and the handicappers put in a lot of time into, into something like this. It's on a Saturday, it's, and it's coming up shortly, so this one is uh, uh, some major races from Gulfstream Park. There's some major races on that day, so it has, the day has a lot of interest anyway. Mm -hmm. um, next week is the Pegasus Cup, and that's, we're rolling it out for customers to sign up that day as well as the following Saturday, so it's two weeks, it's in two weeks. And so the races are identified. They're not at all the same tracks. We have, we have a, 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 a different, there's, I think there's five from Gulfstream and uh, some other tracks we have some, but five races from Gulfstream, the major, mm -hmm. the major races of the day. 
and we'll print special programs for those customers with just those 10 races and those will be the, those will be there so it's be an all-day event mm -hmm. and the money for those prices comes from the promotional trust fund is that's that, what I'm that that requesting idea? correct yep. and, and some of the contest is a pay to enter and then that's where you where, where you fund it from uh, in this case uh, as I said you know our customers are what have you done for me you know lately uh, we thought a free to enter was the way to go with using uh, the promotional fund as the kicker, uh, which makes sense because you know um, you know advertising to use the promotional fund for advertising is um, difficult because of the cost of all the advertising um, and the limited funds that we have in the promotional fund. So we thought this was a good way to you know get a little bit of a. Uh, Mm -hmm. you know something into our customers yeah. hands and a lot of times well, you know a lot of times our hand they'll use that money to bet the right. winners will use that money to bet back right. into our right. and increase the interest in that card which in, which would have the potential of increasing our handle for that particular yes. day it's more more people looking at more races even if they're around the country and they'll stay longer perhaps and what right. and we'd like to do this you know I'd like to come back you know, multiple times if this is successful, which we think it will be. Uh, there's already been a lot of excitement at, at, at the plant for it. Mm -hmm. So um, if, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's successful and we think we believe we'll be able to come back multiple times within the year to have different ones, uh, have one um, highlighting our live, one or two highlighting our live card as well. Um, so, you know, we're, lo yep. we're hoping that this, uh, yep. I think, it's a, I think that the, the staff did a well, did a good job thinking outside the box and putting this together and everything that uh, has been submitted um, was uh, through brainstorming and their mm -hmm. thought process on what our customers would really like and we used uh, Lenny's model and we kicked that to the side for the survivor <laughs> for the survivor one which was which in other jurisdictions has worked out pretty well but for that particular night <laughs> so, it was a flop. Um, T just roughly, if you, if anyone can estimate, just how much does the promotional fund kicks in generally for for the year, for for Penn? I, I have a little bit more history with it, so we haven't used the promotional fund for a while because there was a hiccup um, in the transition period between our way and Penn. Uh, uh -huh. There was a hiccup where it was overpaid, so we've actually been making up for that hiccup over the course of. Uh, of the five years since uh, Penn took over. So mm -hmm. it's just started to grow and we didn't tap it because we wanted it to, to gain some traction and get some, uh, I mean, Chad okay. probably has the numbers, but yeah. uh, we wanted to let it grow before we started to try and do okay. anything constructive with it. Sounds good. Yeah, and you, you, if you can get back to me on these, that's, that's fine. I'm just sort of would like to get a sense as to kind of like what's the universe of money that we might be seeing and then how do each one of these requests might compare to to that amount of money That's it's a much smaller uh, percentage than the capital improvement trust fund yeah that, that goes in that was my sense but again just order of magnitude for, for future requests mm -hmm. i think and it's I a great idea by the way and i think it's it's a way to keep people engaged but um, and I like to come back as many times as I can with these requests so I can see the smirk on Commissioner Stebman's face. <laughs> <laughs> well, the question Video doesn't do it justice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree that it's a, a totally um, um, entirely appropriate. It is a promotion. This will drive business. You've done your, done your homework here. Um, I see where it can really uh, gain excitement and people like that. So. Six different winners. That's that's a nice thing too. So, I uh, I think it's it's just it's appropriate way to use those funds. And you have to enter in person. Is that? That's correct. correct. Yep. You actually have to be there to collect as well. Oh, okay. We want to keep them there all day. Keep them there all day. Yeah. <laughs> Before we move, I just want to point out that Mary and Dilly had us at 11:15 at the start of your. Um, presentation and we were at exactly 11:15. So wow. thank you. Wow. She is. She has. Is she's Her killing it. Are she is killing it. Strong. Um, uh, thank you for.
coming today to explain this. Do we have a motion? Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve Plainville Gaming and Redevelopment LLC's request for consideration in the amount of uh, $5,000 to the Harness Horse Promotional Trust Fund for the Winter Wonderland Handicapping Contest on Saturday, February 1st, 2020 at Plain Ridge Racecourse. Second. Any further questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The next item we have um, is also with Plain Ridge Park Casino, and this is um, for funds from the Harness Horse Capital Improvement Trust Fund, um, and this is in the amount of forty thousand three hundred thirty seven dollars and eighty one cents uh, this uh, consideration was approved by the Commission on December 5th and so they went ahead and moved forward with the purchase of a tractor from big boys toys uh, I have included in the packet uh, the opinion letter from Dixon Salo who provided all the documentation I have reviewed the documentation um, they included pictures uh, exhibits, invoices, copies of checks made payable to all vendors, and uh, the request looks like it is in good order. Uh, this does require a vote. No smirk required, but I'm happy to offer <laughs> a motion. Uh, <laughs> Madam Chair, I move the Commission approve Plainville Gaming and Redevelopment LLC's request for reimbursement in the amount of $40,337.81 to to the Harness Horse Capital Improvement Trust Fund for the purchase of a tractor from Massey Ferguson Big Boy Toys, LLC. Mm -hmm. Second. Any questions? Thank you, Chad. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thank you, Steve. Okay, and on to local aid. So each quarter, in accordance with Budget and Appropriation 1050-0140, local aid is payable to each city and town where racing activities are conducted. The amounts are calculated at 0.35 times the handle from the quarter ending six months prior to payment. The local aid payment for the quarter ending December 31st, 2019 is in the amount of $255,315.91. This amount reflects the total from racing that took place in April, May, and June of 2019. And on the second page, you will um, see a breakdown of the handle as well as distributions that are payable to each city and town. And this item also requires a vote. Any questions for Chad? Do we have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the 2019 local aid quarterly payment in the amount of $255,315.91 pursuant to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts 2019 budget and appropriation as described in the memorandum dated January 13, 2020 in the Commissioner's packet. Second. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank you. Yeah. The uh, next item for racing is the 2018 Suffolk Downs unpaid winnings. Uh, as we've discussed previously, these are in a year um, <clears throat> uh, past. Um, for Suffolk Downs, for um, the unclaimed tickets in 2018 was 246000 $692.90, and <coughs> this is payable to the um, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, financial analyst Chad Bork has gone over this amount with um, Suffolk Downs. And um, just as a note, we do have another guest, uh, Jessica Paquette is here um, on behalf of Suffolk today. And this does require a vote from the commission. I have a question. It's just a, out of curiosity. Um, do you know, so Suffolk 
has closed. So we will have this report next year for 2019, right? Yes. Do you happen to know what 2017 was? Um, for I just last wonder if year, an the amount, um, it, it's amazing how similar it is from That's year to year wondered, with yeah. all the tracks. Uh, last year, Suffolk, it was uh, 236,084. Mm -hmm. um, so it would it be was, interesting to see if the year of the closing, if people are more vigilant or, uh, I, I just think it will be. An that's correct. If it's been pretty steady. Okay. At um, some point they will be closed, but we will still have outstanding tickets that will be, be due. Out. So right. we'll have to work with Suffolk on that. And these are both from the live raising and the simulcasting? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll still, still we're still, right, I mean, there's still, still simulcasting. Yes. So. Yeah. They're still simulcasting. So um, the amount may not change that much from for this year coming up. That's right. So the sim that's right. For simulcasting, if, if, if simulcasting continues, then there, it will not be a closeout because of simulcasting. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. With the track closed, does somebody now go to the simulcasting location? Because you've got the year to cash the ticket in. How does that work? Just out of curiosity. Okay. Um, I'm trying to remember with the dog tracks. We did. There was a mechanism in place, and um, I'll, I'll have to go back and, and look at what that mechanism well, was. But we did work it out with the track so that those could be that could be done. No, but your question is as to where they're going to observe the simulcasting. It's at the track. Oh, yes. no, but can no, you put? Is that where you physically go also to cash in? To cash. In. I'll wager on a horse race potentially even though the the, the live racing right track if, is closed yeah if, yeah yeah this on the final casting you can still do it if at some point it was completely shut down then we would work out a mechanism like they did when yes. the dog racing ended yes. and supposedly everyone's on notice for that it's a year but they they yes would uh, the question would be if they're wondering because they have if they have a, uh, a live winning they could still go Correct. To yes. staff. So, so maybe we could help on that outreach. It's a, a, a good question. Um, and, and maybe on our website, reminders. Just remind to people, people that, that, they that they're can. still open. Yeah. Yes. yes. Like always, it's only a one year, but they are still open at the, if that's in fact how they can cash right. out. Yes. We can okay. Right. Interesting. Okay. Um, and you need a vote on this, Dr. Leibow. Yes. We Any further questions for Alex? Do I have a motion? Um, Madam Chair, I move the Commission approve the payment of $246,692.90 from Sterling Suffing Race Course to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for unclaimed winnings from 2018, as described in the memorandum dated January 16, 2020, included in the Commissioner's packet. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. Thank you. Moving on to F. So the next one is the um, unclaimed winnings from Wonderland, and that uh, was determined with uh, Chad and um, Suffolk, which is using the Wonderland license at Suffolk Downs, to be $3,849.33, and this is, uh, requires a vote of the commission. I'm sorry, I flipped to the wrong page. Sorry. Okay. Uh, any questions on this? Do I have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the payment of $3,849.33 from Wonderland Greyhound Park to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for unclaimed winnings from 2018, as described in the memorandum dated January 16, 2020, included in the commissioner's packet. Second. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? 5-0. Thank you. Okay. The uh, next one is the recovery of the unclaimed uh, winnings from Plain Ridge. And um, Chad, in uh, determination with the folks at Plain Ridge, determined that it was $187,000, 252.47. And again, this requires a vote of the commission. Any questions? <clears throat> Do I have a motion? No. Madam Chair, I move the commission approve the payment of $187,252.47 
from Plain Ridge Racecourse to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for unclaimed winnings from 2018, as described in the memorandum dated January 16, 2020, included in the Commissioner's packet. Second. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. As always, thank you for the great preparation. Oh, do we have one more? We have one oh, more. One more, my apologies. Raynham. <laughs> we have the um, unclaimed winnings from Raynham, Taunton, yes, Massasoit, Greyhound Associations, um, and that uh, amount was determined to be 142977 And again, this does require a vote of the commission. Any questions on Raynham? Do I have a motion? Madam Chair, and move the commission approve the payment of $142,977.55 from Raynham Taunton Massasoit Greyhound Associations to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for unclaimed winnings from 2018 as described in the memorandum dated January 16, 2020, included in the commissioner's packet. Second. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. Now I can say a proper thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As thank always, you both. so yep. well prepared. Thank you. So now we're moving on to item number six, which um, is the commissioner's uh, updates. I'm just going to look at my time. Two minutes ah, ahead. Three, yeah. Three, two minutes ahead. <laughs> That's pretty good. Marianne. Rest assured, I won't call you out if we get behind, because it will be, it will be reflective of me and our team here as opposed to you. So thank you. Um, we now are uh, looking at item 6A. The last meeting, we had begun our discussion around process for uh, the search for a permanent um, executive director. We now, of course, have the benefit of Karen Wells as our interim. Um, executive Director, as I uh, said in earlier, it's critical to not only my fellow commissioners and me, but I believe for the entire uh, staff and for the good of the commission and the benefit of the Commonwealth and our licensees that the process be open, transparent, and competitive um, in order to um, meet all of our obligations and to do so under the open meeting law, of course. Uh, the last time we were here, we uh, tabled um, a vote, uh, although I'm not sure we really anticipated a vote necessarily around whether or not to um, decide whether, uh, to retain an executive search firm or use internal resources. Before I turn this over to um, Commissioner Zuniga, who is um, assisting in this process, Commissioner O'Brien, you had recognized then that you needed to learn a little bit about the history of what had occurred with the past two executive directors, and I wondered if you wanted either comment or if you've, if you've gained the benefit of that. I did. I talked to Commissioner Stebbins about his involvement in the prior two exercises, and I also talked to Tripti, um, head of HR, in terms of what the process was, looked at what was followed at that time. So I feel more comfortable being able to take a position today. So okay, I good. would defer to Commissioner Zuniga in terms of process. Good. And then we um, outlined, or you outlined, the pros and cons of both that we at least had highlighted um, between ourselves. Uh, I don't know if you want to summarize the discussion briefly mm -hmm. and then um, seek some guidance. Yeah, um, I, will, I will try to summarize uh, uh, briefly. I, um, We've done, uh, we've had two instances of searching for an executive director and we've done one of each, one with internal resources and one with an executive search firm. Um, I think there are, um, you know, uh, positives and, and, and um, uh, you know, and on both, uh, we can gain the perspective of an outside uh, firm uh, that perhaps comes with, um, if we conducted a, a search, uh, if we decided to engage a search firm, uh, that may um, come at the expense of uh, perhaps delaying a little bit more of the process, uh, but that doesn't mean it would be any less um, of any less quality necessarily. Um, we talked about that in the past. I don't think it's it's necessary to um, um, to, to to rehash all of that, although uh, although we could. 
I am frankly, um, I, uh, you know, indifferent about, as to both. I think there are positives on, on, on both appro approaches, um, but perhaps, um, you know, leaning more towards, uh, you know, having a search firm come help us out. The provisio or the caveat that I would put in and also remind ourselves is that we looked at um, all the existing contracts for professional services and we did not find um, a firm, we felt we did not find a firm uh, or a group that could really fit within uh, all of those pre-approved contracts by the, by the state um, procurement uh, OSD. Uh, so we believe if we went this route that we would have to do a procurement of our, of our own and you know, designate a procurement management team and, 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 and we certainly are confident that we have those internal resources uh, ready and able to, to execute on that. Mm -hmm. um, I have had some time, I initially, uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, kind of assumed or was leaning toward um, uh, an inside process uh, because of, um, I, I thought we, uh, we, uh, we handled that well on the one occasion we did it, um, but I have really looked at the added value that a, that a firm can bring as well as I was uh, persuaded by um, CFAO Lennon who talked about uh, resources and the resource drain it would take to do this properly. And I think it's important to all of us that we do it properly and thoughtfully and um, really, um, you know, um, make sure that that's part of our process. So I at this point am, um, um, thinking that using a search for firm would be appropriate. So I guess I'm the spoiler in terms of, uh, I'm not opposed to it, but in the extent we move that way, I think there's, and I don't know how this vote's crafted, but I don't think it's an all or nothing because I do think we can move forward with an internal process and internal resources that's then supplemented by an outside firm that can then help push out further or headhunt if that falls short. And to me, I felt like that was a better use of addressing the resource issue right, right. and then t making the most of a search firm. My conversations on the scope of those services could be anywhere from soup to nuts, drafting everything, the postings, handling it, vetting it, screening it, et cetera, before it came up, to you do your own. If the push out isn't satisfactory, the return is not satisfactory, you can also pull in teams that function more like headhunters. And so, talking about resource issues, when yes. I talked to everybody about process, I was almost coming down in a middle ground that we did some on our own and then pulled in when appropriate. You know, I, I, that's a very good point and I think we should have uh, clarified that um, the alternative of using an executive search firm presumes that there will be a, a, a lot of internal resources involved um, because we have that experience, we have that capability, uh, there will be, um, you know, a, a consultation of you know the job descriptions and the attributes that we feel are necessary, and that all goes right to you know internal resources. Um, so I, I think that is the presumption of the second alternative, rather than doing it all on on on, on uh, resources. But that is clearly something that we would pay attention in terms of the scope that we write for uh, um, for an RFP, uh, as well as how we can begin to gain traction and you know, not be uh, um, too delayed while, we, while this procurement is going. Right. Um, there's, there's a lot that we can also draw from the past two searches that's already in our archives um, as to what was valuable and, and, and how staff I interacted here. Yeah, I, the, only, the only thing I would add, and you know, the discussion of where a, a search firm may be able to add value, uh, you know, if we find we're not seeing the candidates that we look for and we really need somebody to go out and kind of knock on doors and, you know, uh, entice or recruit people who might not have been thinking about the position, uh, I think would be, you know, a critical, uh, a critical resource to have. Um, I do want to go back to one step that, uh, I'd raised the last time, which was, and it might be through a search firm, uh, but taking the step of also uh, 
having a conversation or having a professional have a conversation with our directors, perhaps the five of us, uh, you know, the, the MGC team, um, to create a piece uh, that could be used in addition to, you know, a regular job description, but something that gives that candidate an idea or feedback as to what the current uh, life is of the commission, what we're focused on, what some of our staff, what we might be looking for in, an, in our next executive director, something that's just beyond the nuts and bolts of a job description. Um, and it might be something that a search firm could do. It might be something that uh, uh, an organizational consultant has some expertise in. I don't think it's a lot of dollars. You know, I know our bidding allows us to find somebody if we get three competitive bids under $10,000, and that might be sufficient to do the work, but I don't want to forget about that piece because I think it's, it's not only going to be helpful for us and helpful for our team to give us feedback, but I think it's going to be helpful for the candidate. We've now been up and running for mm -hmm. uh, almost eight years. You know, where is the life of this um, commission? What are we doing? What's, what are going to be some of the issues that we need to focus on going forward? And I think that might be a, a, a good tool for us to use as we look for candidates or if we move ahead and engage a search firm to use as well. So. Uh, I don't like the idea of adding another step to the process, but I think it's important and could have a more condensed time frame. Mm -hmm. I actually think that's an essential step to the process, and that's where I do disagree with Commissioner O'Brien. Um, and so don't feel like you're the spoiler, because I'm a spoiler uh, as well. Um, when I stop to think about where we are, as you say, in terms of the, the, of the life of the commission, uh, there have been two executive commissioners uh, executive directors hired during the course of that period. Uh, you've used different processes. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's a good time to pause and really assess what are the qualities we are looking for in an executive director at this juncture. And um, <clears throat> in order to do that in a safe and open way, particularly in the event we have internal candidates, I do think using an outside resource will allow us to get very um, genuine and, and comfortable input that does not imply negative. Um, and so, and they, and they would have those skills. To, in that first step, that input will allow us to really get the job description that we want. Because I don't, I don't know if I, if we only heard internally, I might be, more likely to agree with our our own team with a consultant it might make me think um, you know in a more rigorous fashion uh, and that's not because we just rubber stamp anything but I just would probably think they've been here um, I'm I came in February those insights so having someone who um, does this for a living the development of a job description is one of the most crucial pieces of a search. We could flip it, and you know, I think we thought about when we talked earlier, Commissioner Zunica, that maybe a hybrid approach would be to use the outside resource at the beginning, develop a job search, and then use internal for posting recruitment um, and then and, and, and assisting in the interview process. And with that comes some caveats, because again, I am concerned about our internal resources. If we um, have a um, convene a procurement management team and give some very clear guidance on timelines and we include a contract that is rigorous, that will come with a price, and I understand that. You, you know, when you ask for faster service, you pay more. But um, it may be that we will be able to have directed resources rather than stretched resources to help us. So I, I, um, I think this is a big job. We are going to talk about compensation next. It's a big job in state government. Um, it, compensation reflects that. I think investing in the process at this juncture requires outside expertise. And, and, and we have a very lean team here on HR.
you know, we have a very lean team, which is something we need to think about for the future. But right now we have um, one person in Springfield and one person here. Well, I, I, I assume that we would, we would be involved in others as well. I, I um, you know, I, well, I, but that I would imply that we would be, t you know, just, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I just want to make sure the other thing to clarify on, on Commissioner Stebbins said, you know, st interviewing us and the management and directors, and then you went on to the MGC. I think this is an opportunity to, to go throughout our entire team. And I don't mean to go like this. It's this. I mean, it's, we're an entire team. We're a small shop, but to get input all the way through. So. Mm -hmm. If you are questioning somebody or using our resources, it's going to feel different if it's somebody who has that skill set to, like you suggested, you know, an outside consultant would know how to navigate, how to question appropriately to get feedback. And so that's the only thing I wanted to add. Well, you yeah, no, use I mean, resources. it is, I mean, we're making assumptions as to how a process like that goes. I think there's invariably, anybody that comes from the outside is only going to be as good as you know the, the the conversations that you know mm -hmm. that they have internally, and I understand mm -hmm. that there may be a different comfort level, but but I think everybody's a professional here, and is going to be candid with whomever is going to be you know um, uh, 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 trying to compile all these attributes and edit the description. We have a role in that. We could do it in a public meeting and come to any number of uh, times and and say you know I think more of these, less of that, whatever the mm -hmm. case may be. Um, I just, uh, we again, some of these has to play out and it depends on the firm that's outside, but there, there will, nobody is going to be effective if there's, you know, uh, not a lot of input from uh, internally, and I just envision that, that it would. Um, and we would find ways to, to make sure that that happens in a candid and professional way. I think for the five of us, um, we will be candid. Uh, I do think there's some merit when we talk about this, um, speaking to other people in the organization, um, there may be some hesitancy. Yeah, no, and, and this is not a lot or nothing. I, I mean, I, I'm just uh, agreeing with uh, Commissioner O'Brien that it's, it's, it's a mix, and, mm -hmm. and there's, mm -hmm. there's a balance there. I, I cannot tell you exactly with precision what, what that is because, you know, we don't know who we're going to get and how that plays out. Um, but, you know, uh, assuming that we're, we'll have a, a good outside resource, we'll use it in the most effective way we can, and that includes a lot of um, internal uh, input or thought. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I just, um, perhaps we're just sort of, um, you know, saying the same thing. Saying the same thing I, from I two think, different yeah, viewpoints. But I do, yes. yes, and I just think that um, I am trying to be sensitive of the fact that we're at a, at a certain juncture where we want to make sure our process is, is really understood to be a process that embraces our entire team. And and with an outside resource, there is, a, I think it's quite understood in, in organizational behavior that when um, certain people inquire of questions that require candidacy, not everybody feels as safe and open as one would hope, but one would understand. And I think you, you, you expressed it. It's you know, among us, of course, and, and even among um, our team that we interact with, but um, you know, there, there is, in order to, be, to truly get the input that I think I would be seeking to inform our job description, um, having a degree of process that's safe and fair and open would be really helpful at this juncture. I am absolutely willing to you know, use our internal resources and understand that any search requires that. As I mentioned at the last meeting, I just came off an, ex uh, an extensive executive search um, for a, a nonprofit in which I serve, and it, it required a lot of internal resources internal resources we really are short on here at a starting point. And I think it was the director of those, um, it, was, it was Derek Lennon who said we are, are shorthanded. So I'm very aware of, we want to continue to make sure our HR department does everything it needs to do to keep our team going strong here now 
And of course, you've already accessed the input in the past. Of course, we'll be um, seeking those resources to help. But um, I think just the fact that we have some division here might indicate that having an outside consultant could help us. I think that's a, that's a consensus. I, I, I think we may be trying to split I think what is the semantics for me in yeah. terms of this motion is sort of in discussion it hinges on executive search firm, which, and maybe I spoke prematurely to say I knew enough to take a position today, but to me, that's a term of art that doesn't necessarily encompass what Commissioner Stebbins was talking about, which I agree with which I think should be happening even if we weren't in the position of looking for a new ED. And I guess I'm not 100% convinced that saying go ahead and get an executive search firm is actually going to achieve what Commissioner Stephens is talking about, which I think there is unanimity here that that's a, that's a process we should undergo. So maybe if other people with more experience can yeah, educate I mean, me on it. Um, you know, finding somebody, and again, it, it, it may be the, the talent or skills of a search firm to conduct this first step, or it might be the skills of an organizational consultant to kind of come in and help us do this first level of review. And I think we could possibly undertake that step at the same time issue an RFP for a search firm, and I think to the next phase, which is help us go out and find candidates, doesn't mean we have to accept the proposals, you issue an RFP, and mm -hmm. you can choose not to select somebody or change our work plan, but you can almost have uh, those two tasks, I think, on a parallel track. I do think there are firms that, uh, and we might be, by doing that, adding a lot more costs, and maybe, um, you know, the next step would be, and I would recommend that uh, Commissioner Zuniga um, convene a procurement management team he would be permitted under the open meeting law to include another commissioner. Um, I think that there's some education to, you know, about how we could include what I think you and I were in agreement on in terms of the initial steps of getting a pulse of the, you know, internal pulse to inform the job description. I do think that that is something that executive search firms, that is their first step in the process. And then the search part is, is something that follows. It's not, they're not, a, a, it would be a misuse. It depends on the firm. Well, that's right. That's right. And so my concern is might as be a drafted, group. this is a narrow I, movement forward so, that I don't think actually so maybe gets we, us where we could the say, one place we are all in agreement. Maybe we could say outside resources, resource or resources, but try to get the one that's most efficient to accomplish what we want. In other words, it doesn't have to be a consultant and a firm, a consultant and inside. But if we can agree that it's external, and, uh, you know, well, whether what it's I'm one or two resources. External as to getting the pulse versus, I mean, so Commissioner Stebbins' sort of approach of, you know, getting the pulse is one, is one thing, and I guess I am conceptualizing it differently than proceeding from the get-go externally. I am, I am concerned about if we try to do this on our own, it will not be. I'm not talking about the pulse way. internally. No, but even own. afterwards, I don't think we have the resources to conduct a very competitive, open process um, that includes the potential for strong internal candidates um, in an efficient and fair and open way if we decide we're going to rely on what are such limited internal resources. So I, I, I don't feel think moving so. forward in the first instance, though, says we're stopping there. So I guess I'm just envisioning it moving, we, as, well, I don't moving see forward. But so, not. but if we're in I, RFP, I'm getting a little doing, lost here. Are, are, we, RFP, are we talking about two firms well, now? That's what I'm hearing, perhaps. No, what I'm saying is potentially, and I don't like the wording of what's put in front of us in terms of what would you suggest? going forward. I, that's I don't, I didn't, I didn't that's see what that I said. Motion. If people could educate me in terms of the verbiage I didn't of see going the forward, because I absolutely embrace the idea of going out either under the thresholds in terms of getting, you know, verbal mm -hmm. or written three quotes to move forward on that, and or an executive search firm that has that capacity while you're also doing an RFP so for a search itself, you know, what is the terminology we're talking about here? I feel like, uh, Mr. Grossman, you look like you have an idea. Oh, well, I'm glad I looked that way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do think then it, it, apparently there's language and emotion. I wasn't involved in that crafting. Um, so no one should ever be tied to that language. 
Do no. you have a suggestion in terms of what well, you would move? I mean, I, but I do think we have a disconnect in terms of No, no, because I, I might be in, uh, we might be aligned is what I'm wondering. Um, is moving that the commission approve the search process for the ED um, by procuring external, I don't know how, how you would phrase it, external Professional assistance services. in conducting you know, uh, uh, organizational baseline assessment and or um, I, a I, search team. So I, that it's, yeah. there is the possibility that we get to the end of this and say, you know what, mm -hmm. yeah, we need something beyond so or we can move speedily with, you know what, we can do this under the procurement threshold and we can move and, very quickly. So maybe and I envisioned, first of all, simple basic step is we want to appoint and Enrique is well, can I just, intervene, break it down could I just intervene before because I want to make sure she understands that I am aligned with that exactly and you should know that what could happen with the PMT coming together you sit down and you start writing what you're anticipating would be available there could be some um, you know Derek could help in terms of doing some initial due, due diligence to find out what these firms do have available for resources in the range right because uh, whether mm -hmm. it could be a, or, you know an organizational consultant plus or something and then draft the RFP we're convening back that would be my recommendation to vote on the RFP so if that helps it would be we come back and at that point we say you know what we we really do need to you know divide and conquer and do something different but at least we'd be taking the initial step to convene if we decide to go only internal or only um, external for one thing, we might be missing an opportunity. So maybe the procurement team's efforts will reveal this. Does that help? Yeah. Uh, yes. I think, um, I'm sorry to make, if this throws um, a technical wrench here, but um, the, what I'm gleaning from this discussion, I find hard to believe that we might be able to get outside resource under $10,000. This notion that we could oh, just, we have to you know. Do a competitive. Yeah, no, no, this notion that we could, for, for whatever, the first phase um, that I think we might the be able to. The have actually been opt, so isn't it closer to 30? I don't know about in, that. In, I thought it was. Uh, in writing, but not necessarily. No, over 10, I think it's a good. Pro I think that I've been told most recently. No, but in terms of RFP versus soliciting written bids, that's short of that. But I think I was told no. over 10. I think I don't know because of our last one that, that we had, um, where we didn't do a bid, but um, I think that this could be aired out in that process, and we could come back with some solutions, and Absolutely. maybe we do split. And, uh, but I, I think. The main thing is whether or not we're going to seek any external resources for help initially. I, I think there's a consensus, so we have a consensus that we consensus are. On that. So I'm wondering if the motion is more along the lines of um, approving the commencement of the search process for an executive director in the Mass Gaming Commission by convening um, a procurement team to draft, you know, an RFR for executive search um, skills and um, an internal organizational assessment survey, something like that, that gives more specific direction to the PMT team designating Commissioner Zuniga as the commissioner, as the point person on that PMT, but with a little more direction in terms of what we're looking for. Right. Yeah. Sounds good. And again, I think you can do I'm very parallel clear. tracks. I, I think to Commissioner right. Zuniga's point, this first step may go above a quick process and finding and getting three bids to come in and do the work based on. Yeah, but we can maybe try we find quickly that we can. I don't think yeah. we can do but that. We can, at it. Maybe we find quickly I, that we I, cannot. I right. think that I actually right. asked that question. That's why the idea of, of convening a procurement management team was ne needed yes. because it mm -hmm. exceeds the, in cost. Um, yep. I mean, we, we recently used a consultant and that was under um, 10,000. Right. If we're envisioning that, you know, very limited resource, you know, perhaps. I think because the, the process is going to, you know, as we envision, maybe require yep. enterprise-wide input, it will just be more costly, and 10,000 was the, unless we had a statewide resource that we could use. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't sound like we, we do. don't have that. No, here. no. I mean, we we can gain uh, here by doing parallel, as you suggest. We could um, request three bids, find out quickly whether it's anything is doable or not. 
Mm -hmm. uh, if it is, we would proceed. If it isn't, we could write anything that would be uh, a two-step process, quote for an internal assessment, and we may decide to do the search on our own or do additional work, that sort of thing. It's, 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 uh, we could come back uh, and update at any point. I, my, my caveat is one, efficiency in terms of dollars and time. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, that this does not become so piecemeal that you've lost the efficiency. Absolutely. Right. That would just be a caveat. Yeah, no, no. Uh, a, and I would also assumption. say that I have some other, um, just if, uh, as you're thinking, uh, convening, <laughs> little notes um, you know I I wrote uh, in my notes that certainly efficient um, ex it has to be extensive and rigorous ser uh, search for the the resources but compressed in time I would like to see an organization that's committed to strategies around diversity um, they should be comfortable working with public entities subject to open um, the open meeting law and that uh, they have the capacity to really be able to glean um, input uh, from all, all um, our team members, mm -hmm. not just at the high level. Right. So that would be just a, um, I would be looking for that once we uh, reconvene with respect to the actual uh, approval of any RF, RFP. I, um, I would like to have a, also a we have a motion. We'll need to have a second. We should um, informally uh, learn, um, I guess, at our next uh, agenda setting meeting, a timeline. Mm -hmm. So we have a motion. Are we going to um, repeat I, your motion? I, I've got a revised motion. I think okay. I clarified it a little bit, Thank you. if this makes sense. Um, Madam Chair, I move that the commission approve um, the commencement of the search process for an executive director for the Mass Gaming Commission by convening a procurement management team to commence the procurement process for um, for finding finalists for the new executive director position and or conducting an internal organizational assessment. Oh, As I phase one, he's phase two. Okay. And then uh, Commissioner Zuniga leading that would be Second motion. motion. Could you, yep. could, could, I'm sorry, Say would it you again. repeat it please? I move that the commission approve the search process for an executive director for the Massachusetts Gaming Commission by convening a procurement management team to commence the procurement process for an external firm for the purposes of finding finalists for the new executive director position and or conducting, and conducting an internal organizational assessment. I, I'd like keeping it and or. And or. Because I mean, mm -hmm. we might find a firm that excel at both and it also helps Leaves the wiggle room. to expedite the timeline if we think we can do the first piece without doing a full-blown okay. RFP. So do I restate? Third time is the charm. No. <laughs> I think it's amended. I think it's amended. Okay. I think it's, I think, do we have it? Um, yeah, I think good. we have it. I, I think that's their eyes are greased. I second that motion. <laughs> I second Char, that motion. Shara's got it. <laughs> Thank you, Shara. <laughs> and, um, do we have any further comments? This is really helpful uh, and I hope uh, feels very you know, open to all of our, our team here. Okay. Second. All those in, we, uh, we have, have a second. second. Um, and second. all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero. Uh, Madam Chair, I further move to appoint Commissioner Enrique Zuniga to manage um, the above referenced um, procurement team and execute all steps necessary um, to procure an external firm for the purpose of finding finalists for a new executive director and or conducting an internal organizational assessment. A second. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. Four, with the abstention by Commissioner Zuniga. Thank you. Get Thank you. Out of the annual report, no, no, it's you know. still a majority. See, okay. he's already ducking out, on, <laughs> ducking out on business already. There we go. Um, on the next part of our commission, and uh, we're, we're doing, we're doing still pretty well, Marianne. Um, we have to address interim executive director compensation publicly because the commission does set the executive director's compensation, and um, 
I uh, left it last time that I would work with Commissioner Zuniga to um, look at best practices. We had already commenced that work, and what was missing was that we thought it would be uh, most fair for um, Director Wells and Interim Executive Director Wells to be able to participate and, and give her insights. We did have a meeting um, with Karen, and uh, we uh, considered um, best practices that we've learned generally by using something called Google. Um, and we also uh, did quite a, a bit of outreach to within the state to learn about uh, how interim uh, uh, compensations are set. Generally, the rule um, that we've been employing reflects all that we learned um, with respect to interim compensation. So that was good guidance for us. Um, the general rule, Commissioner Zuniga was, um, if you disagree, interject, was you know a five to fifteen percent boost, but that you look at factors as the um, uh, what uh, additional uh, tasks are are absorbed in the interim, and with a mem an understanding that of course it's not the actual position. You know, uh, we've already talked with Karen that there are certain uh, tasks that an interim would it would be in, it would be inappropriate for her to do because they're long-term tasks and it would not be the right juncture for her as an interim to, to tackle them so um, we we took into consideration also the fact that director wells um, did have this position in the past the general guidance also mentioned um, the length the tenure of the interim positions and uh, whether it will be short, short term, or longer. Mm -hmm. um, that's why it's important, as we talked about, the time, the timeline for our search. Mm -hmm. So I think that we came to um, a recommendation, and I'll leave it now to you, Commissioner sure. Zunica. Yeah. Um, the, the only thing I would add to those um, remarks is um, we also um, look at past practices and consistency among other positions, not only the one interim uh, executive director, but other interim positions we've had in the past. And with that 5 to 15% in mind, we're recommending a 15% um, consideration or, or uh, um, increase to Director Wells uh, that would still work under to, 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 to satisfy uh, other um, things that you pointed out, uh, Chair. Um, it would be uh, slightly less, but not much, of what uh, our prior executive director was making in his full-time uh, capacity. Um, it's it's. Um, I'm it's, going it's to actually there's, there's, help on the math yep. um, because it, you know we have to be transparent here. It is our requirement. Um, director Wells is continues to do her job as IEB director and is currently paid 158,450. $45. That, of course, is all a matter of public record. With a 15% increase, it would come up to $182,213. The prior executive director was, his salary was at $185,000. So um, that would be the practical uh, end result. End result. Yep. And as you mentioned before, but maybe I'll add additional clarification. Within that same uh, guideline that you researched uh, relative to the 5 to the 15 percent, um, if this capacity, uh, in, if this role of interim um, exceeds three or four months, and we'll, we'll, we'll have to come back and evaluate whether, you know, this compensation still um, is, um, is appropriate. And we can come back at any time. I think it sounds entirely reasonable. I appreciate the research. Um, rather than just saying this is a good number, um, you know, really looking at best practices and whether it be time and prior experience in the position, mm -hmm. um, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. I, I would agree. I appreciate the due diligence in looking at the, the process that's been used. Um, I would just raise a caution flag that what we're setting Karen's interim salary at isn't necessarily uh, mm -hmm a determinant for what salary will be for the next executive director because that's all based on years of experience and other factors so I don't want to 
mm -hmm. necessarily pigeonhole us into saying this mm -hmm. would be the salary for the next executive director. I think that's still up to our discretion. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a, an important addition. No, I, I would agree. I think given the, the nature of the experience and the position of the departing ED and then the roles that um, Director Wells is taking on and also maintaining the primary responsibilities of an existing unit mm -hmm. absolutely warrant doing what would be uh, the 15 under past practice. Right, and I should also note that she has um, in the executive director position, not the IAB um, director position, has absorbed additional management um, responsibilities. So that was also another factor uh, for us to consider, not lost on us. Um, any further questions, comments on that? Um, not so bad. It's, it is our requirement, so thank you. Um, do we have a motion? Madam Chair, I'd move the commission approve an increase of 15% to the salary of investigations and enforcement bureau director Karen Wells as compensation for her performance as interim executive director for a pay period beginning January 19th, 2020 until the commission appoints a permanent executive director. Second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Five zero. Thank you. Now we have any further business? Any further updates that you want to discuss? No. I have just one real quick one. Um, I had a chance about a month ago to speak to a group that we've regularly been in front of, which is a group of hotel finance and tech executives. Uh, they've periodically heard from us on what's happening with gaming. Um, and I threw out the question of, you know, this group is primarily centered around, uh, uh, they primarily work in the Boston area, and I asked the just broad question of what impact have you seen since the opening of Encore Boston Harbor? Um, considering that summer is a busy month for hotels in the Boston area, uh, the few that responded said, we saw no impact really in terms of occupancy during the summer months, obviously following the opening of Encore in June. So uh, that was good to hear that we're not having a, that our licensee is not having a negative impact on some of the other businesses, but may actually be contributing to the success of everybody. But mm -hmm. just anecdotal, not scientific feedback. But it's something our research will eventually address, I suspect. So, oh, but well, anecdotal, yep, yep. yeah. Something we'll eventually get to. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No. Ah. Move to adjourn. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. And uh, we're at 1214. Thank you. And thank you to all who helped put this together today.